السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على تسليم على نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين This is our immense pleasure to welcome you all to our weekly English lecture on Uh, contemporary issues in zakat and uh, usher inshallah and today uh, we have a special guest speaker uh, dr salman ahmed sheikh who will be conducting the lecture inshallah this is a part of our activities and events uh, organized by islamic economics association of kuwait university and at as it's uh, promoting the sharia compliant uh, programs uh, strategies models and modules uh, especially in the uh, field of islamic uh, finance and banking and do we are uh, conducting lectures talks workshops trainings forums and seminars uh, both in arabic and english languages Uh, as you know we do have programs in every day from uh, saturday to friday and we do have also some other programs uh, especially uh, skills uh, programs um, and in islamic finance and banking programs we are uh, like covering some uh, wide range of uh, areas of islamic bank and finance and topics that related to islamic microfinance islamic insurance and islamic capital market equity market and we also uh, uh, try to conduct some talks on specific topics like uh, suko retail uh, wealth management debt management um, corporate banking products uh, practices and and some other contemporary issues a uh, part of that uh, today we are uh, having this session on contemporary issues in zakat and usher and we would like to invite our uh, guest speaker dr salman ahmed sheikh who is uh, a project coordinator and editor uh, islamic economics project and editorial advisory board member imaral international journal of islamic and middle eastern finance and management dr salman has done his phd in economics from national university of malaysia and masters in economics uh, from institute of business administration karachi pakistan in islamic economics and finance he has published papers in ssci scopus and era index journals along with chapters in books published by web of science publishers and dr salman has presented in international conference and national uh, seminars programs uh, in turkey malaysia japan brunei indonesia and pakistan he is a recipient of two imaral highly commended paper awards He is also editorial advisor board member of Emerald, uh, and uh, he is also editor of Moral Reflections on Economics, which is a monthly uh, periodical published by Islamic Economic Projects. This is our uh, honor to have Dr. Salman Ahmed Sheikh to conduct the lecture. Please welcome Dr. Salman. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear my voice? Assalamu rahmatullah. Yes. Yes, doctor. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, sure, please. Yes. It's perfect, doctor. Uh, all right. Is the screen visible? Yeah. Uh, you can put it in uh, slide mode, maybe. I think it's better, yeah. Uh, 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 is it uh, fine with the slideshow or should I yes. have yes. it in the uh, normal slide? Yes, doctor. Yeah. Yep. So, Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and uh, thank you again uh, to Kuwait University Islamic uh, Economics Association and especially uh, Dr. Muhyiddin for inviting me again 
this is my second time uh, having an opportunity to uh, present uh, on some topic in Islamic uh, economics and finance. Uh, the today's topic is um, uh, a very important topic, but uh, there is a little bit uh, less discussion on uh, this uh, in our uh, contemporary discourse as compared to uh, some of the other issues in Islamic finance. So I hope that uh, it will be an um, uh, important talk and it will uh, uh, shed some light on what are the contemporary challenges uh, that we face uh, when we talk about the institutionalization of uh, zakat and waqf. So I would discuss uh, uh, what are the issues that emanate from the uh, juristic perspective in zakat and waqf uh, and also uh, in usher, which is also a very important institution. And uh, what are the contemporary challenges uh, when we try to institutionalize uh, these institutions and use them in the uh, public policy framework. Now, uh, this is going to be my presentation outline. First of all, I would discuss that what are the issues in um, uh, the institutionalization of the system of zakat and usha. And then uh, I would also highlight that uh, uh, if we go by um, the classical understanding, uh, there are certain potential inconsistencies that we find in um, the assessment of zakat, in estimation of zakat, and also in the collection of uh, zakat. And then uh, uh, by uh, looking at those the challenges, uh, we would also uh, talk about that what can be the different ways of uh, reassessing uh, the, the whole institution of zakat in terms of how to administer it in the modern uh, contemporary economies. And then finally, I would discuss one proposal of uh, how to institutionalize zakat and waqf in an integrated uh, structure for delivering uh, microfinance. So that would be the application side of uh, uh, using zakat to share and waqf in the integrated microfinance structure. Salman, uh, yes. Slides, uh, slide is not moving, I guess. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. Uh, let we are, me we are, try it. Is now, uh, now it's okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's okay now. Presentation outline. Yes. Now is it okay? All right. All right. All right. All right. Presentation outline. And now I am moving to the next slide. Uh, is it now visible? Next slide. Uh, no. All right. All right. Not visible. Uh, uh, all right. Is the current slide showing the table uh, with the, the title no, Zakat, no. Work and Ordering? Sadka? No. Current right. slide is a uh, presentation outline. Yeah, now is yes. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. And now is the current slide uh, showing the table? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, you can press right. it. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. So first of all, when we talk about uh, Islamic social finance, uh, we come across different kinds of uh, institutions like Zakat, like Usher, like Wakaf, like um, uh, Sadkat and Nafila, which we can call as uh, ordinary Sadka. So there are different features in all these institutions and which make them uh, more usable under particular circumstances and uh, less useful if the circumstances change. For instance, when we talk about Zakat, uh, it is compulsory on Muslims. But when we talk about uh, wakaf and ordinary sadqa, it's not compulsory, it's voluntary. But when we talk about zakat, there are specific heads of zakat which are specified in the Holy Quran. And uh, we have to ensure that the zakat is paid on these particular heads of zakat. We cannot use it uh, generally for all kinds of purposes. But when it comes to wakaf, when it comes to sakat and nafila, there is more flexibility in the utilization of funds and benefits of these institutions. Uh, likewise, in zakat, we have a specific financial or commodity flows um, uh, once a year when it comes to zakat and uh, at the time of the harvest when it comes to the uh, concept of usher. But when we talk about wakaf, when we talk about ordinary sadka, the flow of benefits is on a sustained basis. And if we allow certain provisions like the exchange and substitution of the asset, the wakf assets can be grown, can be, uh, can be um, uh, invested, and uh, there can be increase in value over the period of time. Uh, in the work facet. So this can be achieved in work and there is possibility of uh, storing the, the, the value that is invested in work. Whereas in zakat, there is flow of funds. The zakat uh, 
is paid uh, from the rich uh, segments of the society and then it passes on to the poor. There is no uh, provision or no flexibility in storing uh, the zakat -able fund. They have to be uh, paid to the recipients of zakat Whereas in the case of work, in the case of ordinary sadka, there is a possibility of institutionalizing the whole um, system, uh, whereby it is also possible to store the, the value that is invested in the work and that is uh, also uh, mobilized through ordinary sadka. And then there are also issues with issues with respect to transfer of ownership. In zakat, it is important to ensure tamlik, it is important to ensure uh, ownership uh, to uh, to the poor. Whereas in the case of Wakaf, in the case of ordinary sadka, there is more flexibility in terms of how the benefits are provided. They can be provided directly through asset ownership and they can also be provided indirectly by providing certain services that come out of the uh, assets, whereby it is not necessary to uh, ensure that um, the asset ownership also takes place. So uh, what this slide basically uh, talks about is that there are different features in different Islamic social finance tools and instruments. And utilizing those features, they can be uh, effectively used in particular circumstances where one institution would be more useful as compared to the other institution. So what is important is that we need to ensure that we are matching the needs with the particular features of these institutions, maybe in a isolated way or in an integrated way to ensure efficiency and uh, scalability of any uh, social welfare program that we want to uh, make utilizing these institutions. Now we come to the, uh, the important part of this presentation, which talks about that what are the certain challenges that we face in the administration of zakat, in the collection of zakat, uh, in the institution of zakat, given the changes in modern economy, uh, which were not uh, there in the past. Now, when we talk about zakat, one important thing is that what are the assets that are subject to zakat and what is the exemption limit? Now, the exemption limit is known as nisab. So, nisab is the value of wealth below which there is no uh, zakat. If a person owns a, 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 a form of wealth which is uh, uh, less than the value of nisab, then that person is not obliged to pay zakat. Now, the issue is that the exemption limit has to be one in a in a uh, uh, in a in a in a system. But what happens in zakat is that there are multiple nisab. Like, for instance, uh, there is Nisab on gold, which is almost 10 times as much as the value of Nisab in silver. So even in the cash and cash-like um, uh, forms of wealth, the, the issue comes that there are multiple Nisab. In one Nisab, one person would be considered as uh, eligible for Zakat. And in another Nisab, in another exemption limit, the person would be considered as, uh, as responsible to, uh, to pay Zakat. And then when we come to livestock wealth, there are different uh, 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 bases of nisab in different types of livestock. For instance, uh, in case of goat, uh, less than 40 goat are exempted from uh, zakat. In terms of cows, less than five uh, cows are exempted, uh, less than 30 cows are exempted from zakat. When it comes to camels, less than five camels are exempted from zakat. Now, if a person is having a diversified portfolio of some cash, some uh, financial investment, uh, some goats, some cows, some camels, then the person might be having uh, enough aggregated value of wealth, but uh, the person would be considered as uh, exempted from zakat if the value of livestock held is, let's say, 25 cows, uh, three camels, or 35 sheep and uh, some amount of, let's say, silver, which is less than 612.35 uh, uh, gram of uh, uh, silver. So uh, this issue comes that when there are multiple nisab, then it is possible that if a person is, that is having a diversified uh, portfolio of wealth, then that person might uh, get exemption from zakat. Uh, whereas uh, another person who is not having a diversified wealth portfolio and only having, let's say, silver worth uh, 700 uh, grams of um, silver, the value of that would be considered as um, zakatable. So that is one issue that uh, comes uh, in front of us when we talk about the institutionalization of zakat. A diversified wealth base may result in zakat exemption despite a person having sizable aggregated value of wealth. And... Um, when we come to the next issue, the issue comes in that uh, when we talk about the normal taxation system in public finance, 
it is important that the similar form of wealth is uh, given similar treatment so it's important for the principle of equity um, now if we have this understanding that some wealth is zakatable and other forms of wealth are not zakatable for instance uh, uh, gold and silver is zakatable but diamond is not zakatable uh, unless it is held for trade if we say that uh, um, the 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 things which are used uh, personally are exempted from zakat then uh, the issue comes in that there are uh, there has to be some limit some um, uh, specification of what comes in personal use and what comes in personal needs for instance if a person has um, so many uh, luxury bungalows or so many uh, cars are all these uh, assets going to be considered as uh, exempted from zakat or would we have to define uh, a line as to what is the uh, subsistence level of income which is necessary to uh, to have survival and what is the normal standard of living and there has to be some threshold uh, beyond which we have to consider uh, the the excess form of wealth as zakatable if we don't have this understanding that what will happen is that uh, there will be zakat on some assets and there will be loopholes or there will be uh, opportunity for people to hold their uh, wealth in assets which are not considered as zakatable and they would be then uh, exempted from zakat even though they are still uh, um, having uh, enough aggregated value of wealth and they belong to the uh, rich segment of the society so for instance if a person has uh, lots of uh, residential houses uh, and lots of uh, luxury cars uh, very expensive uh, watches and so on so in that case if we um, if we allow all the things in personal use to be uh, exempted from zakat then it is quite possible that a rich person who is um, spending uh, on all these luxury uh, items would be uh, having an opportunity to avoid zakat so there is well zakat at 2.5 percent on gold and silver even if not held for trade but on other minerals like diamonds there is no zakat if not held for trade if just before the zakat due date a person converts cash or gold into diamonds then the zakat due amount will go down another issue which comes in that um, in usher we have this understanding that usher is applied on uh, production that is coming from land agricultural production which is coming from land now we know that in contemporary economy the production is not just limited to agriculture there is now production in industrial sector there is now production in services sector so we know that now the agricultural production is having a much less contribution in gdp as compared to industrial sector production and as compared to the services sector uh, contribution to the uh, gdp so if we only consider that production from agriculture is uh, uh, subject to usher then it has much less value addition and contribution margin so contribution margin is basically the difference between the selling price and the variable cost of production so we know that in agricultural sector there is a huge competition there are lots of farmers so they are selling a, a homogeneous good and that homogeneous commodity cannot uh, basically yield a lot of uh, um, you know profits so usually the profit margins are very very thin in agricultural sector so if we say that um, a farmer who is working in a competitive agriculture sector is subject to the the concept of usher whereas a person who is uh, doing uh, production in industry uh, the corporation who is doing um, uh, production in the services sector is exempted from usher then there comes uh, inconsistency or uh, anomaly so we would be having usher on let's say uh, farmers who might be uh, small uh, land owners and uh, they would not be having this opportunity to deduct their cost of production to deduct their debt and they would have to um, uh, pay usher uh, every time they are producing uh, uh, agricultural commodities then they would be subject to usher but the producers who are uh, doing industrial production and uh, those who are doing production in services sector they would be exempted altogether so uh, is there a case for revisiting the 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 concept of usher uh, is it on just um, uh, a production which is coming from land or is it on production uh, in general because even in agriculture we know that now uh, biotechnology is used to get agricultural production uh, in uh, shafai fik we know that um, uh, and also in other fik as well other than um, uh, hanafi fik uh, it is understood that uh, usher is applied on uh, 
on uh, edible commodities which are storable uh, which can be dried so if that is the understanding then we know that a lot of uh, food uh, is produced inorganically in industries so it is not coming out of uh, land uh, it is coming out of industries so there are agro based industries which are basically doing value addition and which are producing uh, huge amounts of um, agricultural commodities but that is not coming out of land uh, likewise we know that um, agricultural commodities can be produced in labs biotechnology can be used vertical farming can be used so when we talk about vertical farming there is um, uh, agricultural uh, yield that is obtained uh, by having the production in racks and uh, it is uh, vertically rather than horizontally uh, and it's not necessarily uh, going to be uh, produced on uh, on a piece of land so is there a case for revisiting our understanding of um, whether usher is applied only on agricultural commodities uh, which are produced on land or does it also apply to vertical farming does it also apply to production which is coming from biotechnology labs uh, does it also apply to production in general uh, which is coming in industries which is coming in services sector because the issue is that when we talk about services we do not have uh, storable inventories in services sector so for instance if there is a company who is providing airline um, a travel airline company uh, or a, a transportation company uh, let's say uh, having uh, services for rail transport or uh, 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 trucks or so on so all these sectors transportation communication um, information technology uh, so all these services are basically provided simultaneously and they are uh, created uh, when there is need so there is no concept of a storable tangible inventory in those sectors so if we only have this understanding that in businesses we are going to only uh, hold those assets uh, subject to zakat which are uh, let's say in the form of cash or cash like instruments or which are uh, uh, considered as tradable inventory then in services sector we won't have such a, a tradable storable inventory and uh, if we are going to only um, subject them to zakat uh, which is applied on a particular date then what happens is that those producers who are very efficient and who have very high market share and who have very high inventory turnover ratios uh, at a given point in time, they would only be holding inventories which are enough for maybe next uh, day of sale or next uh, few days of sale. Uh, and there is concept of just-in-time inventory where you would not be producing unless you have an order. So in that case, even uh, the industrial sector companies would not be having um, uh, so much value of tradable inventory on their balance sheet when the zakat due date comes. But if we apply usher on uh, industrial production on the premise that uh, usher is applied on production in general uh, it, it was applied on agricultural production when the production was predominantly coming from agriculture but now if we have production in agro-based industries in industries in general and also in services sector then all those value creating activities uh, producing activities should be considered uh, under the concept of usher and the uh, flexibility in usher system is that it's very easy to institutionalize and uh, uh, and administer because in usher each time when you are producing you have to pay usher uh, and you cannot deduct cost of production you cannot deduct your debts against it so it's very easy to uh, deduct usher at source uh, especially in agricultural industries where um, a government is a monopsonist government is the buyer a government is buying the agricultural uh, yield from the farmers and in that case at the time uh, when the government is um, buying those agricultural commodities the government can apply uh, the usher so it's uh, very easy to administer so should high value added production be exempted from production levy or should there be uh, usher uh, applied on industrial production as well. Now, this is one question which we come across in contemporary, uh, you can say, economies where the production is not necessarily uh, only concentrated in agriculture, but is also coming from industry and also in services sector. Now, another issue that comes in is that uh, there is inconsistency in the, the burden of uh, zakat or in the, uh, um, you can say, application of zakat based on different nature of businesses. For instance, if there is a producer and trader of uh, very expensive items, like, for instance, uh, expensive consumer durables, expensive specialized capital goods, now uh, such a producer would be having a very high value of tradable inventory. And that 
producer or trader would be considered would be asked to uh, pay zakat uh, if the tradable inventory is still there it is held for trade but it has not uh, been sold yet so because it is held for trade inventory if the zakat due date comes we say that that producer and uh, trader will have to pay zakat on that tradable inventory but when we talk about services uh, like for instance um, uh, those who are uh, in the food business they would not be having a very high a value of uh, tradable inventory and they would not be subject to uh, any of uh, uh, these uh, rules of zakat so uh, the former class of traders uh, uh, mentioned uh, in this slide who are selling expensive consumer durables or specialized capital goods like tractors like uh, heavy industrial equipment if they have the held for trade inventory on the zakat due date they would be subject to um, pay uh, zakat but uh, those who are in services sector, those who are uh, in businesses where there is no storable tradable inventory or where the inventory value is very, very um, uh, small, then they would be not having um, uh, uh, the, the zakat uh, 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 obligation. Uh, another issue comes in is that uh, when there is business cycle downturn, where you are not able to make enough sales as a trader or as a producer, now, in that case, you are having a trouble. If let's say there is a recession, you have uh, uh, produced your uh, goods, but you are not able to sell them. So in that case, you are having a troubling situation. You are not able to have high inventory turnover ratio. You are struggling in your business. Now, in that case, what you need is support. What you need is incentive. What you need is subsidy. What you need is relief. Now, if we look at the understanding of uh, Zakat, which only applies uh, uh, zakat on uh, on production in uh, when it is held for trade which is the current mainstream understanding the current mainstream understanding is that uh, uh, on industrial production on services sector production there would not be any uh, usher there would only be zakat on assets which are held for trade now if that is the understanding if we apply it in a recessionary period in that case there is a business cycle downturn sales are not increasing inventory turnover ratios are very low the producer or trader is a struggling now in that struggling phase instead of having a relief he or she would be asked to pay zakat because the inventory is uh, remaining unsold on the zakat due date so if inventory is taxed rather than income then the trader and producer struggling to make sales would be burdened even more through well zakat irrespective of whether a trader and producer is able to make enough sales let alone earn any profits so the producer or trader would have to uh, basically uh, sell the assets uh, at throwaway prices and uh, it might not uh, uh, enable him or her to uh, get enough profits. So it may instigate a deflationary pressure in the economy when unsold inventory is sold at significantly uh, deflated prices, causing uh, more recession, causing more unemployment in the case when businesses uh, fail to survive. Another issue comes in is that uh, when we look at the balance sheet, only the liquid assets are subject to zakat. In the current understanding, um, cash is considered as subject to zakat when we talk about businesses, account receivable, any balances that you uh, are supposed to receive from others is also considered as subject to zakat. And then inventory, tradable inventory is considered as subject to zakat. Investment that you have made are considered as subject to zakat. So these are the different kinds of current assets which are considered as uh, subject to zakat. So all of these are liquid assets. But the major portion of assets are there in fixed assets like land, property, plant, equipment, machinery, heavy industrial equipment. So all these assets are having much greater proportion in the fixed assets, in the total assets, whereas the assets which are considered as zakatable are only a, a small part of total assets. But in different, uh, you can say, juristic schools, the understanding about the debt exemption or uh, debt uh, adjustment is different. So in Hanafi Fiqh, um, the classical understanding is that all debt is considered as um, adjustable against the zakatable asset. So if you sum the value of cash plus account receivable plus inventory plus investments in the balance sheet of any corporation and deduct from it all the total liabilities, then the zakatable base is going to be negative in most of the cases because you are deducting the total value of debt against the value of only some forms of current assets. In that case, uh, most probably in most corporations, you would have a negative zakat balance. 
uh, zakat base balance in that case they would be considered as uh, uh, mustahikeen zakat rather than uh, having an opportunity or having an obligation to to pay zakat and i have done an empirical exercise on corporation that are listed in uh, pakistan if we take the aggregated value of um, cash plus account receivable plus investments plus inventory and deduct from it all even just the current liabilities the zakatable base turns out to be negative and in that case we would be saying that the corporation sector who is having uh, you know uh, the most um, uh, you know share in invested capital in a modern economy, they would be considered as uh, zakat exempted, whereas zakat would only be levied on small farmers. It will only be levied on small traders who are struggling and not able to make uh, enough sales. And at the end of the year, on the zakat due date, they found themselves not able to sell their inventory, and now they are being asked to pay zakat as well. So this this uh, is an issue which needs uh, a revisit. Now, if we talk about zakat on corporations, there are different proposals and. Uh, the issue in those proposals is that uh, the onus is on on the niyat, on the intention of uh, the person who is investing in those shares. For instance, if a shareholder has a niyat, has a intention to hold these uh, shares as uh, as um, as investment for long term. So in that case, the understanding is that we are going to look at the balance sheet. And in the balance sheet, uh, we are going to sum the value of cash plus account receivable plus inventory plus investments. And we would allow deduction of debt uh, from this balance. In that case, in most corporations, the balance turns out to be negative. So you would not have to pay any zakat on that. Now, uh, about debt, there are different uh, points of views. In Shafi Fik, uh, it is considered that uh, uh, it should not be allowed to deduct debt against the zakat asset. In Hanfi Fik, it is allowed to deduct all the value of debt um, against the zakat assets. And there is uh, also a difference of uh, opinion, which is between these polar, uh, you can say, views. Like, for instance, the contemporary scholars like Maulana Taki Usmani, uh, he has said that only the current liabilities should be or the current portion of debt should be um, should be adjusted against the cathedral asset, or only the debt which is taken to uh, obtain or purchase as a cathedral asset should be considered as uh, uh, adjustable, whereas debt which is not taken to uh, buy any cathedral asset it should not be considered as uh, uh, exemptable from from uh, from the payment of zakat. So. Uh, the issue is that if we allow debt to be adjusted against uh, only the balance of cash plus account receivable plus inventory plus investment, in most cases, the corporations would have a negative uh, zakat balance. Now, if we have the understanding that uh, if, let's say, the uh, investment in shares is made with a short-term investment motive, then in that case, we say that we would consider the investment in share as, as wealth. And the whole value of that wealth is going to be considered as zakatable. Now, there are you know, different economic implications of both understanding. And the problem is that we are putting onus on uh, a person's intention. Now, a person's intention is very hard to know. You know, it, it is very hard even to uh, know the amwale zahira. It, it is very uh, hard to uh, basically assess uh, what the person owns. Uh, and, and such ownership is visible. Uh, it is amwale zahira. So if it is very hard to even know amwale zahira, uh, it is extremely uh, hard or even impossible to know the intention. So if we want to institutionalize the system of zakat and ushad in contemporary economy where government would be basically taking on the role of uh, assessment of zakat and then uh, collecting the zakat uh, uh, which is assessed, then in that case, we, we have to have a system which is not just uh, putting all the, uh, you know, um, uh, onus on uh, on uh, on a person's intention because in that case uh, it's very hard to know the intention and in the case of real estate uh, modern uh, scholars some of the modern scholars in the mainstream view uh, they say that the real estate is considered as zakatable only when it is purchased with the intention uh, for sale and if that intention changes during the period of holding then also the real estate would not be considered as zakatable and even on the zakat due date if a person changes intention if a person says that well uh, i had been um, having this uh, intention to uh, sell this uh, real estate and i am holding it uh, only for the purpose of sale i uh, i purchased it as a investment um, 
uh, 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 I uh, made investment in it uh, from the investment motive. I would I was not uh, investing in it uh, for my uh, personal use, but uh, just on the zakat due date. If uh, the person says that now my intention is different, now my intention is no longer to to uh, uh, to consider this uh, real estate as uh, health or trade um, uh, asset, uh, I may. Um, uh, use it for my uh, personal needs. I may use it personally. So in that case, we would say that well, uh, the the real estate is not zakatable. So if we have such an understanding, then the huge amount of wealth which is invested in real estate, it would not be considered as zakatable. World Bank estimates that sixty percent to seventy percent of the wealth in an economy is basically in real estate. So in real estate, there is huge amount of national wealth. If we say that uh, even if you are buying um dozens of uh, plots and uh, if you do not have an intention to uh, to basically um uh, sell them then you are exempted from zakat then basically we are providing a very safe heaven to to basically park your wealth in certain forms of uh, assets um uh, which are not considered as zakatable now uh, these assets and these forms of storable wealth were not very prevalent in in uh, in a period uh, of uh, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and uh, afterwards. So uh, over there, most uh, storable form of wealth was uh, uh, livestock. Uh, it was um, uh, gold and silver. So if let's say the storable forms of wealth have changed, now people are investing more into financial investments, more into real estate, then we have to have a, a clear understanding of how to uh, basically uh, uh, get them um, uh, under the under the umbrella of zakat. Otherwise, we would be providing a very easy, safe heaven to convert your uh, wealth into certain uh, assets other than uh, gold and silver, and you would be uh, basically having an exemption uh, from zakat. So this is a very important issue that uh, should we allow all the debt to be excluded in zakat assessment on shares? If that is the case, then basically all the corporations would become uh, uh, exempted from zakat, and they are basically you know having the most amount of uh, invested capital. Uh, in businesses in contemporary economies and there is also a need for a filter on consumption to ensure redistribution we know from the uh, example of uh, uh, hazrat uh, hazrat umar um, uh, may allah be pleased with him uh, his example is there uh, in front of us uh, when uh, he saw that uh, the horses became uh, very very expensive and they were having a value of uh, uh, you know several uh, <coughs> Uh, amount of uh, camels then uh, when he realized that well it's a it's a very uh, expensive storable form of wealth he uh, did not uh, keep uh, horses uh, exempted from zakat he brought horses under the zakat net likewise uh, we have uh, examples in the in the period of hazrat usman uh, Talan Ho. so <coughs> sorry uh, we have examples of uh, uh, jurists who are expanding the the coverage of zakat to contemporary assets and forms of wealth and if we <coughs> we would not do that consistently then we would be allowing a very easy safe heaven to avoid uh, zakat there is also a need to have a understanding that what is a normal standard of living so for instance if let's say a person has uh, one or two cars or one or two houses this is enough for his personal consumption now if he is investing a lot into uh, uh, sport cars or uh, <coughs> branded watches uh, or uh, luxurious bungalows, then we have to basically have a limit on what is considered as personal need. And beyond that, we should uh, uh, <coughs> have this understanding that uh, if you would have uh, lots of um, uh, plots, uh, lots of luxury bungalows, lots of uh, sports cars, then it would not be considered that all of these are um, your uh, your personal assets and uh, 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 are assets uh, which are belonging to the Zaruriya. Now we have this uh, provision in FIC uh, that uh, Imam Shatbi and others have classified deeds into Zaruriya, into Hajiya, into Tahsiniya. So we can use this understanding to basically uh, evolve uh, uh, a system where a certain standard of living would be acceptable and beyond that if let's say a person is investing even in assets like cars sports cars luxury bungalows they would be considered as zakatable otherwise we would be providing a very easy way to avoid zakat and then 
uh, in the distribution of zakat another uh, important issue comes in which is uh, tamleek the understanding in tamleek is that uh, you have to make someone owner of the amount of zakat uh, so that uh, the zakat obligation is uh, is complete uh, is uh, 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 it is it is considered necessary that uh, you have to make someone owner of zakat amount for the zakat obligation to be uh to be considered as complete and uh, you are uh, considered as uh, having uh, completed the obligation of zakat now if we go by this understanding that one, what happens is that there are certain kinds of public goods and common property resources which are very beneficial for the society and they benefit the society uh, members but uh, there is no private ownership uh, in common property resources or in public goods but they are very useful for the people and people use them so Uh, is zakat amount for the mustahikin? Uh, if we go by this understanding, then even the direct and indirect benefits can be provided from the zakat amount. But if we consider that uh, the harf uh, lam uh, is basically representing the the uh, the compulsion to ensure asset transfer, asset ownership, uh, it is uh, it is uh, uh, signifying tamleek. Uh, requirement then in that case uh, we would be having a much you know constrained way of uh, utilizing the zakat funds so there are scholars who say that uh, uh, in the eight heads of zakat uh, lam harf is used with the with the first four and fi word is used uh, with the with the last four and only the understanding that zakat amount is to be used for the welfare of the people is consistent with both the lam harf and also with the Uh, fee harp. So there are scholars like Yusuf Al-Kuzawi himself, and also uh, Mawlana Amin Hasan Islahi, and there are many other scholars who say that uh, uh, it is not necessary that the benefit uh, of the zakat amount has to be provided necessarily through tamleek. If it is provided through a common property resource, through a public good, which is also uh, benefiting the poor at large, then this is also possible. So these are some of the issues. now if we are going to revisit uh, it is important that we should not ignore the nusus so if there is clear guideline from quran or sunnah or hadith we should not basically bypass it we cannot do that if we would do that then definitely we would be uh, uh, making a huge error so there are some scholars who have uh, said that well revisit the nisab revisit uh, the whole uh, understanding no that is not true and that is not the right approach because if we have a clear guideline from quran from sunnah from hadith uh, we should not bypass it we need to revisit within the framework of nusus so nusus shall be the primary source to think over redesigning the administration for instance uh, nisab and rates which are mentioned in nusus they cannot be altered so we cannot say that zakat was 2.5% in olden times now it can be 5% now it can be 10% no we cannot do that we also cannot change the nisab but within that if let's say uh, quran says that whole minam walihim if quran says that um, you um, uh, take out zakat from their wealth then wealth is basically uh, going to have different forms in different time periods in uh, olden time periods it might be um, considered as uh, live stock live stock is a major uh, form of uh, storable wealth uh, in let's say olden times but now if let's say uh, wealth is invested more into real estate financial investments um even um you know uh, uh sports cars or uh, uh, stuff like that paintings uh, uh, expensive paintings uh, uh, and uh, diamonds and so on so minerals so if these are the contemporary um, storable forms of wealth which are more prevalent which are more valuable then we have to uh, uh, also uh, bring them under the Uh, head of zakat and and we have a precedent we have a precedent from uh, hazrat umar al qalan who who brought the uh, horses into the zakat night and he um, uh, got to know that uh, they are very valuable and they are uh, even more valuable as compared to camels which are considered as zakatable so why not uh, there should be a zakat on that and there is also need for ijtihad in some cases for instance um, uh, if we go by the understanding of um, uh jamhur fuqaha other than the hanfi jurist they consider that there is nisab for usher which is 653 kg of uh, uh, of production now that is uh, very useful when it comes to uh, solid production but there is production now in liquid form as well for instance honey for instance uh, 
uh, oil. So there has to be, uh, you know, a revisit of uh, how to apply, you know, um, a, a, a unit which is uh, very useful for, uh, uh, let's say, solid uh, forms of production, but uh, it might not be uh, applicable to liquid forms of uh, production. And also it might not be applicable in services sector production, uh, where you do not have a tangible uh, production, but still there is value creating activity. Uh, so such deliberation can be revisited and modified in the light of experience uh, and new knowledge and new ways of uh, administration. And uh, we know that uh, in Hazrat Usman Ritalanho period, there was an administrative decision taken to make a distinction between Amwale Zahira and Amwale Batina. Now, uh, nowadays, we consider that this is this was part of uh, Nusus, this was part of uh, uh, the, the Sharia. It's, it's not the case. Uh, we need to understand that. It was just an administrative decision taken uh, to ease the, the zakat uh, uh, assessment and collection and administration. But if let's say nowadays we have block technology, uh, blockchain technology, nowadays uh, uh, it is the government itself which is providing the, the, the property rights to, uh, to cars, to real estate, uh, then in that case, uh, it's very easy to, to basically um, uh, identify uh, who is the owner of a particular car, who is the owner of a particular piece of land. Mm -hmm. It's very easy because it is the government itself which is providing the property rights. Government knows it firsthand when uh, a particular asset is uh, transferred to a particular owner. So it is in the government's knowledge. And the Amwale Zahira of uh, 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 the, the past are, uh, you know, uh, Amwale Batina. You know, it's very hard to basically um, uh, look at a livestock and know its owner as compared to uh, know who is having uh, ownership of uh, a bank balance in a in a bank account. So the Amwale Batina of past are now Amwale Zahira and Amwale Zahira of past are uh, are, are somewhat difficult to, to identify uh, and difficult to, uh, to basically know the owner of uh, livestock as compared to uh, in past. So if, uh, if Amwale Zahira and Amwale Batina distinction was only for administrative reasons, if let's say now we have blockchain technology, now we have this compulsion that uh, all people in all countries have to uh, submit their wealth statement. And in that wealth statement, they have to declare all their assets. If they don't, they would be, uh, they would be doing an illegal activity by not declaring a particular asset which they own. And in those assets where government itself is giving property rights, uh, we, we can very easily identify the owners of those assets and we can drop those assets under uh, Zakat. And there has to be consistent application of Zakat in all forms of wealth. Otherwise, if we would be only considering some kinds of production like dried food items as um, subject to Usher, and if we would be ignoring all the agro-based industrial production, industrial production in general, or services sector production, uh, if we would be just uh, applying zakat on um, gold and silver and uh, ignoring all the other forms of historical wealth, then there would be a very easy way to avoid zakat. So if let's say we come across those hadith, which, uh, which mentioned that uh, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, saw one lady who was having a, a gold bangle, uh, he said, uh, Prophet said that uh, uh, if you have not paid zakat on uh, this uh, gold bangle, then uh, 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 be ready that uh, you might be given uh, bangles of fire on uh, on judgment day. So if let's say that lady had uh, uh, had been wearing not uh, gold bangle, but uh, diamond jewelry. So in that case, what we would uh, have uh, 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 obtained uh, as, as guidance from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he would have still uh, be, be consistent and uh, and uh, applied uh, the same principle on other forms of uh, storable wealth. Likewise, if Hadith mentioned that if livestock uh, is uh, is uh, uh, is there with uh, with some person and that person has not uh, paid zakat on uh, on that livestock, then that livestock would be would be you know trampling uh, that person. Uh, uh, on judgment day. So if let's say the livestock would be hurting the owner if zakat is not paid uh, on judgment day, uh, what about the expensive sport cars owners? What about the uh, owners of uh, huge amounts of real estate? There are people who own, you know, uh, huge amounts of real estate. If we consider all of these exempted from zakat, and if we only have this understanding that it is based on niyat, and if niyat changes, 
during a uh, holding period or even on the zakat due date uh, the person is exempted from zakat then in that case we would be uh, providing a very easy way out to to basically avoid zakat which is not only is um, uh, is is not uh, acceptable from the religious point of view but it is also having a very negative impact on the socio economic welfare because it's not just that we say that it's the makruh uh, to 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 do such a, uh, zakat arbitrage activity uh, it is makruh it is definitely not ideal it is definitely uh, going to be um, uh, you know um, uh, there, there, there will be an accountability in after life, but what about this life? It, zakat is not just a religious responsibility; it is also a very important socio-economic welfare institution in Islamic social finance. So, uh, if we go by the principle of anfa lil fukara, we have to uh, basically uh, ensure that uh, such uh, uh, you know huge amounts of wealth invested in real estate, invested in uh, you know other uh, contemporary forms of wealth and uh, such forms of production which are contemporary and uh, which our Fokaha would not have seen, like uh, Professor Yusuf Al-Kuzavi, Allama Yusuf Al-Kuzavi has said that uh, our Fokaha, uh, you know, saw uh, certain forms of wealth and they applied Islamic principles very consistently, but they are no longer there and we have to apply th those principles and their, uh, their understanding to contemporary forms of wealth, otherwise we would be uh, having a, you know, the essence of uh, the issues in Zakat, so if we go uh, and look at uh, Fikus Zakat by Yusuf al Kuzavi, he says that uh, uh, if uh, Zakat is meant to purify wealth, if that is the you know purpose of Zakat, that it is meant to purify wealth, as is stated in Nusus, it is stated in Quran, then we cannot have this understanding that uh, some form of wealth would be subject to Zakat, whereas the other uh, forms of wealth, which is having much huge proportion in in the in the overall national wealth. Uh, we cannot have this understanding that they uh, would not be considered as uh, uh, having the need for purification. If the zakat is purifying wealth, if the purpose is that, then it cannot be the case that it is only purifying, let's say, wealth which is stored in gold and silver, but not, uh, you know, which is uh, stored in uh, real estate or sports cars or expensive paintings and so on. So, um, the general text of the Quran and Sunnah confirm that there is a right, a sadaka or uh, or a uh, you know uh, benefit in all uh, forms of wealth, which is the understanding from Kardavi Fikus Zakat uh, and uh, uh, Yusuf Al Kurdavi. He says, Allama Yusuf Al Kurdavi, that wealth of any kind is in need of purification. If we go by this understanding, this is not you know a, a deviation from the Nusus. It is basically a consistent application of the Nusus, uh, which uh, should be um, uh, you know implemented if we are going to revisit it. Now, uh, if we go by uh, the the understanding in Usher, uh, which is in the classical, uh, you can say, um, uh, understanding. If we go by the classical understanding, only the agricultural production, which is coming from land, is considered as uh, subject to Usher. But likewise, the value creating activities are not limited to agriculture nowadays. In the composition of GDP, industrial production, services sector production has much uh, greater value, as I have already tried to explain. So, uh, if let's say Usher is applied on value creating activity. So, so the essence of usher was uh, a charge on the value of uh, production that you are making. Now, uh, no matter what kind of uh, production you are making and how you are making it, you know the production process itself uh, should not be, uh, or the or the place where you are doing the production that should not be the criterion. The criterion should be that you are making a valuable production. So, if you are having any value creating activity uh, in agriculture or outside of agriculture that should be considered as subject to usher. Uh, that would be a consistent application of Nusus rather than a deviation. Otherwise, what we would be saying is that a small farmer who is doing primitive forms uh, of uh, production methods and doing production of food items, um, you know, uh, in land, he or she would be, uh, you know, uh, having to pay usher. But the person who is uh, doing large-scale production, biotechnology labs, large-scale production, vertical farming, large-scale production in agro-based industries, that uh, particular uh, industrialist or um, you know um, uh, agriculturalist would not be considered as, uh, you know, uh, having the liability to to pay usher. That would be quite an inconsistent thing. Not only inconsistent, but from the redistribution point of view, we would be saying that the small farmers are supposed to pay usher, whereas the large industrialists who are producing 
you know um, uh, agriculture and industry agricultural products and industry or who are doing production and industry they are going to be uh, not uh, uh, you know having the obligation to pay usher we know denmark we know uh, many other european countries who are producing a lot in dairy products a lot in um, agricultural production but that is not coming necessarily from the land but if we only confine usher to production that is coming from the land then we would be ignoring and uh, you know uh, giving a very safe haven and and a very easy way out to to avoid usher rules uh, you know uh, if we it would ignore value creating activities or production outside of uh, the uh, you know uh, the land itself so uh, a consistent application of nusus uh, would would imply that we should be considering um, the the extension wherever uh, you know we find the the illat for it definitely this has this istihad has to be done by the scholars istihad bil qiyas need to be done and illat has to be found but if we look at the nusus the illat is the illat seems to be that usher is applied on uh, value of production now uh, in olden times you were doing agricultural production predominantly in the land and you were predominantly producing only the forms of agriculture which were very um, you know prevalent in arabia but if let's say there are other agricultural items so like hanafi jurists they have applied usher on all types of agricultural commodities they have not confined it only to edible items or they have not made this distinction they have said that uh, no matter whether the agricultural production is uh, uh, is belonging to edible items or not belonging to edible items all produced from land should be uh, subject to usher and they have also uh, this understanding that there is no nisab you cannot really deduct anything uh, in terms of cost of production or debt when you are uh, paying the usher so basically uh, it's it's very much like the general sales tax of today the the general sales tax which is applied on production it does not allow your cost of production to be deducted it does not allow debt to be deducted it is applied directly on the value of produce so we can use this uh, contemporary system to basically apply usher in contemporary economies so the the point uh, which i am making is that if the essence of zakat on production is to charge value creating production uh, in a commercial enterprise with a done with a commercial motive then it can be extended to con contemporary value creating activities uh, in manufacturing in services industry so this is you know the basic summary of the proposal uh, so all uh, forms of wealth or value creating activity should be uh, made subject to uh, zakat and usher so zakat should be applied on wealth which is uh wealth which is not invested wealth it is not uh, you know invested with a commercial motive so any amount of wealth or any form of wealth uh, which you hold which is beyond your personal use and which is uh, not invested so if it is real asset you know if it is um, financial asset any non invested real trading and monetary assets that is store value except those in personal use should be subject to the 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 uh, zakat on wealth because uh, quran says uh, uh, quran uses the word mal uh, it does not uh, you know give any exemption and uh, ibn al arabi has said and uh, yusuf al qurzawi has quoted ibn al arabi uh, uh, and uh, ibn al arabi very rightly said that if uh, people say that um, zakat is not applied to particular forms of wealth they have to provide any evidence from from the nusus because if we look at the quran quran uses the word mal and if we look at hadith hadith only exempts uh, uh, that mal that wealth which is in personal use now there has to be some uh, understanding of what comes in personal needs and what does not come in personal needs so if we have basically uh, made this uh, distinction in our fiqh that um, uh there are needs which are in zaruriya there are needs which are in which are which come in hajiya there are needs which come in tahsiniya so we can use this distin distinction uh, uh at the government level to basically um define that this is the normal standard of living and if we are going to see people who are having uh, dozens of houses dozens of sports cars uh, very expensive paintings very expensive uh, Uh, mineral wealth or financial wealth all of that should come under the zakat on wealth likewise on agricultural production if let's say uh, the water supply as capital is provided by the farmer himself herself then there should be uh, nis pusher because the cost of production is high in such a production process where water supply is provided by the farmer himself herself 
but when there is agricultural production where water supply is not uh, uh, coming through uh, investment uh, by the farmer himself it is coming from a natural resource like uh, rain fed uh, land so in those cases where cost of production is uh, low and only uh, there is intensive use of labor effort so in that case the value of production should be subject to the whole uh, amount of usher uh, meaning 10% and if let's say usher is applied on value creating activity if it was agriculture which was the main source of uh, you know value creating activity uh, now if value creating activities or production is happening in industries in biotechnology labs in vertical farms so in that case we should be applying the usher on industrial production and and we would be using the nusus so nusus says that if there is intensive use of labor or capital both then you apply nis pusher if there is intensive use of only labor and um, the water supply as capital resource is uh, uh, is not having any uh, you know um, uh, there is no cost involved as uh, uh, in rain fed land in providing uh, or accessing water supply so in that case where cost of production is low uh you are going to pay a much greater levy which is 10% so if we take this as sense um uh, if we take this as sense that intensive use of labor or capital or both labor and capital that is going to be determining whether nis pusher is applied or whole pusher is applied on any value creating activity or production we can apply and extend this to industrial production we can apply and extend it to all value creating activities where we find that Uh, either labor is involved or capital is involved or both are involved so industrial production with intensive use of both labor and capital they should also be considered as uh, subject to usher and we can use the general sales tax uh, to to basically um, administer the whole system because in usher we say that you cannot uh, adjust your cost of production you cannot adjust your debt so it means that only the value of produce is subject to uh, to, to usher and the sales tax is very much like that Uh, uh, it's a charge which is applied uh, at the level of uh, uh, production facility so it's uh, applied on factories and then definitely they can uh, pass it on to the consumers depending on the elasticity of demand and supply but um, the 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 system of general sales tax or value added tax can be used uh, to to apply usher on uh, contemporary forms of production likewise rental income or financial uh, uh investment income where only capital is involved so when you are basically uh buying a real estate and giving it on rent you are just using your capital uh, you are not using your labor so this is a value creating activity in which only capital is involved not labor so yusuf al kurzawi allama yusuf al kurzawi says that this is a production activity value creating activity in which you are applying capital and not labor so the income that you drive from it should be considered as uh, subject to usher and in the case of usher because there is no concept of holane hol meaning that there is no uh, compulsion to to wait for the whole year to pass on that um, uh, on that income which is earned you would be not allowing the possibility to the person who has earned that income to basically spend that income during the year or convert it into a form of wealth which is not subject to zakat you would not be uh you know giving that opportunity to people otherwise what happens is that in the current understanding what we say is that no matter whatever uh, financial income or real uh, rental income you are getting you would not be asked to pay zakat right away but you can wait for the whole year you can spend the whole income that you have earned you can invest it into uh, assets which are not zakatable and then in that case you would not be paying anything when the zakat due date comes but if you apply usher on that it's very easy to administer and it is also not going to allow this opportunity that you can spend all you have earned and you can uh, invest it in non zakatable uh, assets so that you are uh, exempted from zakat so we would not be allowing that opportunity if you apply usher rules and applying usher rules is also consistent with the with the with the general understanding of usher it is a charge on value of production and where you look at whether there is intensive use of both labor and capital or only labor so based on that you apply nis pusher or usher so if we have industrial production services sector production we can also apply usher rules on that as well so alama yusuf al kurzawi says that if we have rental income where investment of uh, capital is there in real estate it should be uh, subject to deduction at source and uh the the deduction uh, should be made right away like we have in the case of usher so likewise we have consultancy income where only labor is involved 
uh, and capital is not involved in that case also this is a value creating activity which come which can come under usher if we apply the uh, this understanding which i have tried to explain salaried income and royalty income they can also be you know uh, brought under the the, the rules of uh, zakat and usher Dr. Salman, hello. Uh, can you hear my voice? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think Sorry, there is think interruption. There was a, uh, okay, uh, a glitch. Yes, yeah. please. So yeah. just give me uh, five or seven minutes and I, and I oh, will be continuing. You can continue. It's okay. Inshallah. Uh, oh, okay. 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 So uh, let me now discuss uh, uh, some issues in uh, cash work for work in general. When we talk about institutionalization of work, uh, still we uh, find that there are certain problems. One problem is that in classical understanding, we say that uh, only the non-transferable assets should be uh, used in work, uh, and transferable assets should not be uh, used for work. So it was said that well, if you are uh, uh, let's say dedicating uh, agricultural land. Uh, for work of you can uh, dedicate the land itself but you cannot dedicate uh, those uh, transferable assets which are tools of uh, doing production online because they would not have a very long life and for work it is important that the asset which you are dedicating should remain in existence and uh, when it comes to cash uh, cash is something which gives you benefit when uh, you know um, you are spending it so if you keep cash with yourself, you would not be having any benefit out of it. So when you would be using the cash, the cash is no longer there. And if it is necessary that uh, in work, you have to use an asset which is um, uh, always in existence, uh, which does not lose its uh, existence. So in that case, uh, the classical understanding was that, well, we cannot use cash for work. And that is still, uh, you know, uh, the views of uh, many of the uh, Hanafi uh, jurists as well, who uh, who uh, had this understanding that uh, only the non-transferable assets, uh, uh, which are going to have a very long life and which would uh, remain in existence um, for a long period of time, only they can be considered as uh, uh, subject matter uh, for waqf. Now, um, if we look at contemporary economy, what happens is that most people do not have real estate. Most people would not be owning real estate in excess of their personal needs, uh, which they can dedicate uh, for a, a social cause. So most people would be having a, a little amount of cash. Some would be having, you know, few, uh, few uh, reals or uh, some would be having more reals. But uh, uh, most of the people would be uh, would be owning a little amount of wealth as compared to uh, owning uh, the whole uh, you know, um, real estate property in excess of their needs. So if we want to, let's say, mobilize funds at large, if we want to pool funds at large, if we want to involve a lot of people in the mobilization of funds uh, for a social cause, a better way is to use uh, cash work. So uh, in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia and in uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, uh, the contemporary jurists have, uh, have uh, looked at this issue and they have allowed uh, cash work based on the understanding that, uh, well, uh, you can uh, have a cash work and um, it's not that uh, when you are spending cash, uh, you are losing uh, uh, existence uh, of the whole uh, asset. Uh, they say that well, uh, you can use cash with real estate as well. So you can have an asset which is uh, uh, which is real estate, and you can also allow cash work for donations. So in that case, you would be having some uh, asset which is real estate, uh, which is going to be uh, non-transferable and which would not be um, having a very uh, fragile, uh, you can say, uh, life or, or a short life. 
and you can have cash uh, uh, on top of that and you can uh, take on uh, cash uh, work uh, donations and you can still be having a work um, uh, framework where the 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 the, the whole uh, value of work would not just disappear or destroy uh, you know uh, when you are spending cash so cash work is considered as allowed by many of the contemporary jurists but still in some parts of the world especially in south asia like in pakistan like in uh, bangladesh uh, people are hesitant to to give a uh, to give a formal fatwa on it and if you look at the legislation especially uh, i have studied pakistan uh, people say informally that cash work can be used but when we look at the the law itself the law does not recognize cash work uh, as such so unless the law recognizes it you cannot you know have uh, uh, a legal existence of a cash work un unless a law has this provision so uh, for private sector involvement uh, it is important that uh, first of all you need to recognize cash work so uh, informal views and opinions are not uh, considered as uh, as uh, as enough uh, to to basically um, uh, you know have this uh, ability to uh, organize uh, uh, cash work for donations uh, formally and in a legal way so unless the law recognizes you cannot have private sector you know uh, basically coming up with cash work so that is one important uh, thing which needs to be revisited and if you look look at the views of uh, uh, Hanafi uh, fiqh, especially Imam Abu Hanifa, he was of the view that uh, the 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 work facet uh, can even uh, be transferred back to the waqif as well. He he had this that understanding. Definitely, the other jurist, uh, even his uh, two uh, major disciples, disciples and uh, uh, and the other Hanafi jurist uh, would have a different understanding later on. But uh, Imam Abu Hanifa had this understanding that the work for as it might uh, be transferred to the waqif uh, as well so uh, so uh, in his views there is a case for temporary waqf as well and and that has a very uh, important uh, implication because you know there are people who would be having no income source uh, post retirement but during their working age they have savings so they might be very interested to to contribute let's say uh, a particular form of asset like cash or uh, amount in bank or or a real estate for a certain period of time let's say for 20 years for 30 years and they would then be looking to get that asset back when they have the need so in work for understanding what we are saying uh, at the moment is that either you dedicate permanently and you know uh, forever you, you have to dedicate it forever or you just do not dedicate so there is no, you know, in between a scenario, no in between kind of flexibility that you can dedicate, let's say, for 20 years, a piece of land which you are not using, but you would be using it, let's say, uh, when your uh, son uh, uh, is uh, is married, and then uh, you would be giving that uh, piece of land to to your son when he gets married. But for let's say the next 10 or 20 years, you you are not using that real estate. So why can't you, uh, let's say, dedicate that asset? On temporary basis, it it is still better than not contributing at all, or not uh, you know uh, contributing um, uh, even on short term basis. So if we allow temporary work, there will be greater involvement of people who would be uh, you know putting forward their wealth, uh, which is liquid as well as illiquid, for temporary uh, let's say period, and they would be let's say um, uh, you know uh, increasing the scale of funds that are mobilized. So when we look at banks, banks do what? They pool deposits. And if if let's say banks say that you can only make a deposit for a term of 10 years, how many people would deposit in bank? People would not deposit because people would feel that, well, if we are to deposit with a very, very long maturity, and if only that is the option, people would feel like, well, if we need uh, funds uh, on short term, and if we have this withdrawal requirement, uh, why would we invest? So if we look at the banking uh, deposits uh, composition, very little amount of deposits are placed on long-term basis and huge amounts of deposits are placed in current account and saving account. Saving account also do not uh, have withdrawal restrictions. So 70% of the deposits in banks are basically in current account and saving account and only 30% are in term deposit account. And even in term deposit accounts, the most of the funds are deposited on a very short-term maturity basis. So if we allow temporary work, there can be greater mobilization, especially of cash and also of real estate as well. So that is one contemporary issue that, that is very important. In, in, in Imam Abu Hanifa views, we can get uh, some, some allowance for that. 
and also there is another way out another way out is that you consider um, the the investment as as qarz so if let's say you are using cash you might give a qarz and qarz is for a finite duration qarz is not for uh, for infinite duration or it is not given forever so you can use the mode of qarz so when i have spoken with a lot of uh, contemporary ulama they have uh, given this um, uh suggestion that you can organize it not as a temporary work but call it as qarz hasan uh, call it at qarz so when you call it as qarz qarz is for a finite period and then you can have a temporary uh, contribution uh in in the pool of funds which are uh, you know mobilized for a social cause can the assets be exchanged and substituted if such transformation and revitalization benefits uh, the work facilities increases the value of work facilities now we know that in southeast asia especially in singapore malaysia we have seen um, work based hotels work based malls work based uh, shopping centers uh, work based hospitals so one way is to to keep the land is idle and then uh, if you do not really build upon it if you do not really um, uh, renovate it or uh, make it a um, shopping center or a mall or a uh, hotel or a uh, hospital you would not be getting much benefit out of it but if you let's say commercially invest in in such a asset then there is a, a huge benefit in the in the value of asset and it can uh, increase exponentially so can uh, work facilities be exchanged and substituted with a investment motive with a commercial motive now in uh, in our classical fic what we see is that uh there is allowance for exchange and substitution in hanafi fiqh but with with very strict you know guidelines and those guidelines also have a very uh, clear rationale and a very understandable rationale that they want to avoid misutilization but uh, sometimes there is a commercial case for exchange and substitution so our classical fiqh especially in hanafi fiqh it allows substitution but with very strict uh you know uh, guidelines that you can do it only when the the asset which is uh, in work if let's say it's a piece of land it is no longer usable no longer giving any benefit at all so if it is completely unusable completely uh you know uh, benefitless then you can exchange and substitute but only for the commercial motive that the value can increase uh, this much if you invest you cannot do that for commercial reasons you can only use it when the work facet or work land is completely unusable so we can revisit this stance and see that if it if, if the exchange and substitution especially in private sector managed work for increases the 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 way or the work facet is effectively utilized and managed and then another issue is that can the purpose or beneficial use be changed with time through a process with or without Uh, the consent of waqif for instance if waqif in 12th century says that well uh, you use the work land for a particular benefit now it is quite possible that technology changes and that benefit is no longer relevant uh, so can we basically uh, change the benefit or what we can do uh, in in practical scenario is that whenever a work deed is prepared we can at least include one uh, provision in the work deed which allows the court or the government to to basically uh, uh change the 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 benefits clause uh, or the way benefits are provided if let's say times uh, dictate that well uh, the 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 original benefit is no longer necessary is no longer let's say uh, relevant so for instance if a person has said that well provide uh, clean um water drinking water to uh, to residents of a particular facility from uh, from let's say the work income now if that uh, residential location is no longer having enough residents or there are residents but they are uh, you know very rich and they are able to you know afford clean drinking water themselves uh, or if that clean drinking water is already provided by government so so if the benefits are no longer relevant can the benefits be revised as well without the consent of waqif because it is quite possible that the waqif is no longer uh, alive when let's say the benefits um, become irrelevant or uh, they lose their relevance so when times change when uh, technology changes can uh, the the work deed be changed without the consent of waqif so one way out is that we allow in the work deed a provision which gives court or the government the right to basically uh, change the the benefits clause 
and can work be integrated with commercial finance instrument what we are seeing in indonesia is a very uh, very uh, interesting exercise where they are linking social finance with commercial finance so suku is a capital market instrument and it is primarily uh, you know issued with a commercial motive it's a capital market instrument and it is a priced instrument you know the the investors in suku would be getting a return out of it now can we link work with commercial finance now it is very interesting um it has some benefits but it also has some uh, challenges as well because when you involve commercial finance commercial finance would have a profit motive so then it could undermine the 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 social cause and uh, social welfare if let's say commercial motive is integrated but it is also a way to pool more funds as well if we allow this so these are some of the issues in uh work which we uh, which we see uh, now let me uh come to discuss uh, one proposed model uh, which i have also presented uh, uh, previously as well i am uh, i am having this opportunity to present in this august forum as well so this is the structure let me just explain this and then uh, i will stop so in this structure what we are trying to do is we are trying to pool funds from multiple sources of islamic uh, social finance so in islamic social finance we have zakat we have sadaka we have waqf uh, in zakat we can also include usher as well so these are the funding sources uh, in islamic social finance so uh, if let's say there are donors and there are impact investors in the economy impact investors are uh, not having a pure uh, social motive they are having dual motive they have a profit motive as well as a social motive and the donors they only have a pure social motive they are only um, you know uh, contributing with with the with the religious motive and they are doing it for fi sabilillah so if there are let's say people who are uh who are donors uh, who are having a pure social motive and there are impact investors who are having a uh, dual motive profit plus social motive so we can you uh, combine uh, you know funds from both sources from donors as well as impact investors impact investors would be investing in a saving fund the donors would be contributing their charities in the form of sadaka zakat and uh, waqf cash waqf in particular yeah. so these uh, savings would come into a, a cash waqf based microfinance institution and this institution would be basically providing financial and non financial services to the poor and non poor clients now it is very important to to basically target uh, who are poor and who are non poor it is very important to screen who are poor and who are non poor so poor would be provided with finance which is which is uh, not priced which is non market based it would not be a, a a financing which is provided you know which has a price so for instance you would not be providing uh, murabaha financing to poor clients uh, uh, when they are very poor you would be providing them assistance through zakat through sadaqa through cash work you would be providing them not only financial services because if you only provide them financial services they would barely survive and they would just consume whatever they get <coughs> it is very important that you also provide them skills and it is uh, very important so for that you need to engage educational institutions you have to in, uh, in include educational institutes and volunteers who would be providing training and volunteering services uh, to the poor and non poor clients and you also need to create incentives for poor clients not to uh, you know get out of the system not to exit the system so when you provide them lots of you know facilities like for instance uh, <coughs> financial assistance as well as uh, non financial assistance they would be willing to be part of the system so what happens in microfinance is that people are provided with financial assistance for a short period of time they take that but they get out of the system because they do not have enough incentives or enough let's say uh, uh checks to to basically be part of the system for a longer duration because unless they are part of the system for a longer duration they would not be having the chances for social economic mobility <clears throat> so they have to be provided with the subsidies on their purchases so in that case retail stores can be can be you know incorporated in the whole system they would be providing subsidized purchases to the poorer clients in the non poor clients they could be funded with the uh, islamic uh, uh modes of financing like murabaha like ijara like diminishing musharaka and these non poor clients would be having uh, ability to uh, repay uh, these financing facilities with the price in murabaha in uh, the case of ijara in diminishing musharaka they would be paying uh, rents 
and uh, they would also be paying uh, any fees uh, for, for the services that they are uh, availing. And you can also include the takaful and hospitals. Uh, you can include the hospitals which would be providing the takaful facilities. You can also include work-based hospitals and they would be basically providing uh, health facilities to the poorer and non-poor clients. So when you make it very difficult for them to exit the system, they would be willing to, to be part of the system because they are, they are knowing these poor and non-poor clients are knowing that not only they are getting financial assistance, they are getting subsidized purchases from retail stores. They are also getting uh, uh, takaful coverage. Uh, they are also getting uh, skill-based uh, training and development uh, from the education institutes. So these uh, stakeholders like education institute, like hospitals, like uh, retail chains, uh, they also have uh, social motive. They also uh, do corporate social responsibility activities. But when you engage them in an integrated system, you can have a greater scale of social services provided to the poor and non-poor clients. And when you uh, ensure that the funding is coming from diverse sources, it's coming from impact investors and also from donors, it is quite possible to integrate all of that to, to have a scalable model where um, you can provide the microfinance services, which not only provide financial assistance, but non-financial assistance to ensure socioeconomic mobility. Now, very close to uh, these models, we, we have real world uh, examples as well. Like for instance, Brock, uh, you know, uh, uh, tries to incorporate, uh, you know, all, uh, most of these elements. So uh, if we are going to have more of these institutions, I think we can, uh, we can really showcase uh, what Islamic social finance can do. So this is one way we can uh, also effectively utilize Islamic social finance institutions. So in my talk, I've tried to cover that how to make our Islamic social finance uh, institutions more applicable, more robust, uh, more relevant, and, um, and to ensure that they are really achieving the redistribution objectives. Uh, so uh, uh, in doing that, we have to revisit certain, uh, 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 you can say, discourses in our uh, jurisprudential understanding and while we are applying we also need to uh, apply our subject knowledge of uh, economics and finance and also our uh, experiences in uh, poverty relief uh, measures to to see how islamic social finance can be integrated uh, together to 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 achieve a scale to achieve outreach effective outreach and to achieve impact which are three important goals in any uh, social welfare um, uh, you can say program so I would stop here. If there are questions, I think I would be very happy to uh, take those questions. And sorry for uh, taking a lot of time again. Um, um, thank yes, you very much, uh, Dr. Salman, for this uh, detailed and well-explained session, mashallah. So we thank you very much, uh, our dear brothers and sisters. We do have just a few minutes. Uh, I think if you have any question or any comment, uh, we can just welcome. Uh, very fast, either you may raise your hand or you may write in the question box. If there is any comment or any question. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Salman uh, has covered and uh, explained very well the contemporary issues uh, in forms of wealth and produce subject to zakat and he has as well uh, discussed potential inconsistency in zakat management and estimation and collection. Uh, then reassessing zakat administration in modern economics. And lastly, he very uh, well explained uh, institutionalizing zakat in integrated microfinance. These are the four uh, main um, key contents uh, in his presentation. And we uh, dropped uh, the uh, slides, link of the slides in the chat group. Uh, you may get it there. And also we'll upload it in our uh, official page in Facebook and Twitter. So I think uh, there is no question and no comment, Never mind. So we would like to thank our uh, online guest participants, dear brothers and sisters all over the world. We thank you very much for your uh, participation and for joining us in this session. And we thank our uh, management and board members of Islamic Economic Association of Kuwait University, uh, especially our Director General, Dr. Ala Al-Ubaid, 
for their continuous effort uh, in promoting these Sharia compliant modules and strategies globally. And our special thanks uh, go to uh, today's guest speaker, our very well-known uh, expert, and uh, our dear brother, Dr. Salman Ahmed Sheikh, for your time, for your effort, and this uh, very well explained session. Uh, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you and to increase in your uh, ilm, hikmah, and your effort, inshallah, amin. And lastly, if you have any, uh, any last or concluding remark, uh, Dr. Salman, yeah, please welcome. Yes, thanks a lot to the Kuwait University uh, officials, uh, Dr. Mohiyuddin in particular, for inviting me, and you are doing a marvelous job uh, to disseminate knowledge on Islamic uh, finance and Islamic social finance. Um, uh, most of the things that I have uh, tried to explain, uh, I have uh, used the, the book uh, Fikus Zakat by Yusuf al Kurzawi. So I would recommend all of you to read that. And uh, since you are based in Kuwait, and uh, uh, Yusuf al Kurzawi is also from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Qatar, so uh, and he has uh, written this book in Arabic. So uh, I would recommend. Uh, uh, you to read these books. Uh, I would recommend uh, all of the participants to read this book if uh, you are interested in this uh, uh, discourse. Thank you again, Dr. Salman. And we can see some comments and some appreciations, some uh, thanking words from the uh, our guests and participants towards our Dr. Salman. Uh, they really appreciate your lecture and they are thanking you very much. So we thank you all. Uh, thank you very much and see you soon in other sessions, very soon, inshallah. With that, we conclude today's session here. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay.